So we're supposed to talk about the uh, causes and consequences of inequality. Uh, and uh, it's a big, complicated uh, subject. Uh, it's one that fortunately is finally starting to get uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of attention that I think it deserves given the kinds of profound changes that have been taking place in American society over the last 30 years. Uh, but as people start to talk about it more, uh, especially given the quality of uh, discourse, media discourse in the US, uh, often what you get is um, more heat than light. Uh, and you have uh, many people who are participating in those discussions who I think can fairly be called professional dissemblers, uh, whose goal is to throw as much fog, uh, if you can throw fog, uh, put as much fog over the conversation as they can. Uh, and so what I want to do in the first uh, part of my remarks is just to draw um, a, single, a, a simple analytic distinction, uh, which I think is helpful, conceptual distinction, that, help, that is helpful in, help, in getting us going and sorting out both the causes of rising inequality and the consequences of rising inequality. And the distinction I want to make is between two different kinds of income inequality, or two different ways in which income inequality can grow. All right. uh, and the first, I'm in search of a good, the first type of rising inequality, and I'm in search of a good label for this. If anybody has one, I'd love one, because in the meantime, I'm going to use the pithy label, type one inequality, uh, <laughs> is, uh, can, can, be, can be outlined just by reviewing um, some of the imagery that Sylvia just used. You know, imagine you've got a ladder, right, that, that in this case is not the climb to the top, but it's just a, a way of describing the income distribution in a country. And now imagine that the, you just stretch that ladder out so the rungs are getting further and further apart from each other, right? Um, and uh, that would be a kind of rising inequality, right? The 80th percentile is pulling away from the 20th percentile, the 90th percentile is pulling away from the 10th percentile, uh, and so on. Uh, and there has been some growth of that type one inequality in the United States. Right? There, there, has, there is a, a, a general stretching out of the income distribution. Now, many conservatives today, if they want to talk about income inequality at all, they want to convince you that what, what has happened to the United States is basically this type one increase in income inequality, right? that the rungs in the ladder have stretched out. Uh, and the reason that they want to focus on that is because it allows them to provide two different narratives that are comfortable for them, that are non-threatening to them, maybe even politically advantageous to them. The first narrative is a narrative that says, this is all about globalization and changes in technology. Right? That's why you have rising inequality. And you can see the growth of this type one inequality in almost all affluent democracies. That's true. It's actually not true in all of them, but it's true in almost all of them. Right? So they say, this is just, in the words of Henry Paulson, right, former head of Goldman Sachs, who then went on to be uh, Bush's Treasury Secretary, inequality is just an economic reality. And there's no point in blaming any political party for it. Right. So politics is let off the hook. Political parties are let off the hook in this story. It's just globalization. The second narrative it lent, that this type one inequality lends itself to uh, is the one that Charles Murray has offered. Right. We're turning in, we've turned into a meritocracy. People with merit have risen to the top. People without merit, right? <laughs> people who make bad decisions, don't get themselves educated, don't get married, don't play by the rules, they go to the bottom. Right? So it lends itself to a blame the victim kind of narrative. Right? Now, there are other narratives. There are liberal narratives right? that talk about uh, the declining uh, efforts. You know, I think about like uh, Claudia Golden uh, and Larry Katz's work, which emphasizes that really we do need to continue to improve education to avoid this kind of uh, increase in inequality. But certainly there are these two, which you, and you now hear them more and more, these comfortable uh, conservative narratives it's all about globalization, or it's all about the bad behavior of people at the bottom. That's why inequality has grown. And inequality is mostly just about uh, people with merit or high skills pulling away uh, from people without merit or skills. Right. 
So here's where you need to realize that there's type two inequality. Right? Type two inequality is that ladder, the very top rung. Right? Here's a slide. Uh, on, on this, and you saw uh, 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 additional slides about this uh, in the previous presentations, the very top rung is shooting out into space, right? uh, leaving all the other rungs behind. Right? I do have a name for this, winner-take-all inequality. Right? The gains are going to the top, uh, and even the top 1% doesn't really, talking about the top 1%, really doesn't capture how uh, intensely concentrated uh, the gains have been. Here's a slide where we take a look uh, at percentage increases inside the top 1%, and you see uh, that the greatest gains by far are going to people in the top 10th of 1%, top 100th of 1%, right? Uh, I, I like the core slogan of Occupy Wall Street. Probably couldn't, you know, couldn't have imagined coming up with anything better, I think, as a way of capturing the social reality, except that maybe it should be, we are the 99.9%. .9%. <laughs> that would actually be, uh, be a little bit more accurate. I want to just, uh, I, I have to, I, I haven't had a chance to be on a, in a, in a public discussion with uh, Emmanuel Sias before, and I want to, I just have to pause for a second here to realize, to, to say, that much of the work that is going on that has allowed us to focus on this profoundly important type two uh, inequality has been driven by the work that Professor Saez and Professor Peckety did. Um, and I, I just, you know, we can't, we can't measure directly the impact of research and ideas. I was reminded in thinking about this the other day of the famous line in uh, John Maynard Keynes's general theory in which he talks about the profound influence in the world of some academic scribbler. Um, and uh, I, I really believe we have one of those academic scribblers in the room today. Um, and we really all have a profound debt. Um, so, Yeah, thank you. Um, so type two inequality, right? Type two inequality, not, not so uh, uh, easily fit into the comfortable uh, conservative narratives, right? There has been uh, a, a profound shift towards winner-take-all outcomes uh, in the American economy, right? And what I want to suggest in the, uh, and, and so when we think about the causes and consequences of type one inequality, they may be quite different than the causes and consequences of type two inequality. Uh, and I think type two inequality is actually uh, the more, in the long run for American society, is the more important and more alarming development. Right? Uh, and as a political scientist, I have to say, I think it forces us to think about the role of politics. Uh, in two very important ways. The first is that when we try to explain where this type two or winner-take-all inequality comes from, politics is really important. Politics is really important. Uh, a lot of this is a result of public policy, and the previous speaker, Sylvia and, and Emmanuel, both pointed to aspects of this. Changes in tax policy, uh, changes in uh, uh, government transfer programs have been quite important. Jacob Hacker and I have tried to outline a lot of these important policy changes in our book. Financial deregulation, profoundly important in shifting incomes uh, towards the, uh, the wealthiest Americans. Changes uh, in systems of corporate governance and executive compensation. In this case, it's mostly a case of what government didn't do. Uh, but executive pay is much, much higher than in the U.S than it is in other, and has become increasingly uh, profligate in the US over the last couple of decades to a degree that is unrivaled in the rest of the capitalist world. You know, you can look at firms of equal size in other market democracies, uh, they don't pay their CEOs the way that Americans pay them. Right? So public policy uh, has mattered um, it, quite profoundly, it's not the only thing that has driven these winner-take-all outcomes, but it has been very, very important uh, in driving these winner-take-all take, take, take all outcomes. And you can see that, and I, again, some of the slides earlier pointed this out, the shift in income to the top 1% or the top 10th of 1% is much greater in the United States than it is in other affluent democracies. 
Uh, and the only ones that come even close are the ones that have adopted policy profiles, like in the UK, uh, to some extent Canada, that look like the po policy profiles that you see in the US. So politics uh, is really uh, crucial here. That's the first way in which focusing on these winner-take-all outcomes uh, makes one think about politics, that politics has been an important cause. But the other thing we need to think about is that increases in this type two inequality with more and more rewards going to those at the top of uh, the, the, econo the income distribution, that also affects politics. Right? It affects American politics. Uh, and you know, one can just take a step back and ask, if we're turning into an economic oligarchy, or moving in the direction of an economic, uh, becoming an economic oligarchy. Is it really possible to imagine that you could have those kinds of profound transformations in the distribution of economic resources uh, and not turn into a political oligarchy as well? Right. And if you look at the trends over the last 30 years, I think it's very clear that our politics has been shifting in a direction that is much, much more oriented around the concerns and the interests of the wealthiest Americans. There are two aspects of that story that Jacob and I try to tell in our book. One is what we call the organizational revolution, which really means the way in which the wealthiest and corporations have become much more organized and influential in American politics at the same time that the most important countervailing power in American politics, that is labor unions, has been an organizational decline. Right? There's been a tremendous shift in the balance of organizational resources and it's had a profound effect on our politics. The second aspect has been the radicalization of the Republican Party. Right, the, the continuous, and you know, every time I think they can't go further to the right, they go further to the right. right? Uh, President Obama said the other days, and I think this was actually quite accurate, Ronald Reagan could not win a Republican primary today, right? adopting the kinds of policies that he, that he uh, pursued in the 1980s. Right? Uh, the, the party has been radicalized. Uh, here's a slide. People, people often talk about polarization. Uh, between the political parties as if it's somehow about the Democrats moving to the left and Republicans moving equally to the right. But systematic e examination by political scientists of roll call votes shows that overwhelmingly the growth of polarization is a reflective that each cohort of Republicans coming into Congress is well to the right uh, of, the, of the cohorts uh, that they're replacing. Uh, now, to say that the shift to the right of the Republican Party uh, is, um, is a really, really important part of the story is not to let the Democratic Party off the hook. You know, we argue in our book that uh, on these issues, Republicans wear black hats, Democrats wear gray hats. They're conflicted, they're cross-pressured because of the, the, uh, the shifts in organizational power that have taken place in American society. Uh, but there is a huge and growing difference between the two parties on these issues. A simple way to see that, a, a concise way to show that is if you take the difference between the policies that the Obama administration would like to continue on health care over the next five to 10 years and contrast them with the proposals of the Ryan, of the Ryan plan that was just uh, the budget that was passed uh, by House Republicans, the difference the difference in the health care outcomes of those policies is something like 40 or 50 million Americans with or without health insurance, depending on which path you take. Right? And that number would continue to grow over time. Right? I mean, just think about that for a minute. You know, the next time somebody tells you there's no difference between the political parties, right? 40 or 50 million people either will have health insurance or won't have health insurance, depending on which path we follow. Right. The Ryan plan, more broadly, uh, is an incredible indication of the way in which the move towards economic oligarchy and increasing inequalities of political power in the United States can feed back into policy in a way that means it's not just type two inequality that's being affected by government policy, it's also type one inequality that's going to be affected by public policy. 
you know, Grover, I've been following these issues for a long time now. There's this famous line from Grover Norquist, right, who's like the, the anti-tax guru for Republicans, who said he didn't, he just wanted to shrink the size of government by 50%, get it to the size where you could drown it in a bathtub. Uh, and that used to be such kind of a joke, right, because it was so extreme it was impossible to contemplate that something like that could happen, given how well institutionalized the mixed economy and the welfare state were. The Ryan plan is that vision. Right? The Ryan plan is that vision of drowning government in the bathtub. I got to skip over these, unfortunately. 34% cuts in Medicaid by 2022 under that plan. 34% cut in the second most important health care program in the United States. Profoundly crucial for meeting health security needs for many, many middle class as well as lower income Americans. Uh, and that's not even counting the fact that the budget would eliminate all the Medicaid expansions uh, that are uh, currently scheduled to go under law uh, under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, huge tax increase decreases. Hard to imagine, again, that they would be not just doubling down, but quadrupling down uh, on uh, high-income uh, tax cuts. Two-thirds of all the massive domestic policy cuts uh, that, are, uh, that are in the Ryan plan uh, would come from programs for low-income groups. Uh, so if you think people in the lower end of the income distribution uh, have been losing out over the last 20 or 30 years, you ain't seen nothing yet, all right, um, if that's the direction in which policy moves, all right. Uh, it's a bleak, potentially a bleak message. Uh, and uh, the message in, in Jacob and my, my book about how politics has been driving this, people often say it's a real, real bummer to read how this story has been going, uh, going on for 30 years and seems to continue to march in this direction. I have a friend who was uh, reading our book at the same time that he was reading um, Cormac McCarthy's The Road, you know, <laughs> and it, you know, it's just a post-apocalyptic novel of a father desperately trying to keep his son alive. And he said, I couldn't figure out which book was more, more depressing. But, but, and, I, and I said, no, no, our, our, bo our book is an optimistic book. Um, and it is an optimistic book um, because the pessimists are the ones who say, like Henry Paulson, it's just an economic reality and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? It's just globalization, technological change. No, that is false. Right? It's a political choice. Right? So turning around the politics is obviously a very steep hill to climb. At least people are talking about these issues now, and at least they are going to be presented with stark choices during the upcoming campaign on this issue. Uh, but the optimistic news is that it's, it is within the control of a political system in which votes, even though, even though voters are challenged uh, to, uh, to exercise control over this political process. You know, there have been periods in American politics before where it seemed like an economic oligarchy had permanently uh, placed itself uh, in control of government policy, uh, and the political system has pushed back. Uh, that's the challenge that we face today.